So welcome to today's Tuesday talk on interoperability in energy system transformation or learning to reason without oil by Gretchen Backe. Gretchen is currently a senior fellow at the ISS and an anthropologist by training and with additional degrees also in Russian and East European studies as well as Sovietology and photography. Prior to joining the ISS, she has become a guest professor on social anthropology at the Humboldt University here in Berlin and is a part of the Anthropocene Working Group of the Max Planck Institute of the History of Science. Her work focuses on the chaos and creativity that emerged during social, cultural, and technological transitions. And in addition, she works on a variety of other fields, such as the anthropologies of science and technology and arts and aesthetics. She has been working now for almost a decade on energy transitions in the United States and is working currently and in the, in the for next years on the cultural history of fossil fuels. And during the time at the ISS, she's working specifically on infrastructure as resource, retooling the built environment for carbon neutrality. Before we start, please keep in mind that this session will be recorded. And now, please, Gretchen, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you um, for coming. Um, Achim, I wonder, can you read the little abstract of the that I sent around? Because um, I don't have it right in front of me. I can do it. Um, and the reason for this is that I'm actually, um, I'm not gonna talk about infrastructure as resource today. Um, and so I sort of wanted to frame what I am gonna say by this abstract. So you mean I shall read it out or I can put it also in the chat actually so everybody can read it for himself? Yeah, that seems great. And here you go. Um, so I just came back um, from a research trip to like just meaning two days ago for a research trip to Scotland um, and this is the first research that I've actually been able to do um, since before corona and it uh, it really has gotten me thinking as research does it's gotten me thinking about um, Sort of how things are burbling up from um, from the ground or from from what I see from the contacts that I have with people and so this talk is, in a way is an attempt to not really uh, I can't really be analytic about that yet because I just got back but attempt to sort of bend what I was thinking as I framed the project for the IASS um, and my other work to the kinds of um, research questions that seem to be arising now um, so that's the uh, that's kind of why I'm going toward this, how sort of trying to think outside of a single solution. Um, so what I'm interested in is this problem of moving away from a single solution to multiple, multiple interoperable solutions to many aspects of everyday life that are currently um, highly reliant on fossil fuels. So instead of using fossil fuels as a, um, a kind of constant answer to certain kinds of problems, um, kind of asking what the problem is and then thinking about what the solution might be. Um, and then from there actually tying together um, this, those solutions into a new system or a new form of providing energy, for example, for a house, um, for a community, um, making color. This is one thing that I've become very interested in, um, making uh, synthetics, making things cold. Um, and so the, the power or the capacity of fossil fuels to be a good answer to many different kinds of problems, um, I think, and this is where we'll come to in the end, um, has led to an emphasis at present on looking for another singular solution. So that might replace fossil fuels. Um, so um, I will share my screen. Apologies, I have to move you guys. Okay, so I've just come back from three weeks of research uh, in uh, Northern Scotland and in the Shetland Islands. Um, and what we have here is, um, if you see on the right, 
the, the work that I'm doing right now is really in and around the North Sea. Um, and uh, here is the black dots are actually oil platforms in the sea. Um, and the lines are pipe are, are largely pipelines. Um, some of these are electricity cables or electricity connectors, but mostly they're pipelines. My work is here uh, in the Shetland Islands um, and there's a major oil and gas terminal there. That's this picture that you have here uh, on the left. Um, it's very sort of modest in its landscape. It's the largest construction on the islands, um, but you, even when you're in the midst of it, it's very low um, and sort of enveloped by the natural world, which is around it. Um, and that uh, terminal opened in the, in the early 1980s and it's serving um, these uh, no, most northerly oil platforms. Um, and you can see just across from Shetland is Bergen. So where my thing is now in Norway and just to the north is Iceland. So it's really in the sea. Uh, it belongs to Scotland now. Uh, it was long Norwegian. So it has um, sort of a strong connection to both culture zones. And then this is the mainstay of North Sea oil and gas. And Aberdeen is here where these other pipelines come in. And Aberdeen Shire is this area just to the north um, of Aberdeen. Um, so it's also a rural, so this is Pewsborough, Aberdeen is a little farther south. Um, it's a very um, rural and somewhat depressed, um, economically depressed area with a lot of jokes I found. <laughs> I guess Angela can attest to this too, about uh, inbreeding and backwardsness. So people, people are always um, speaking about the, the small communities of Aberdeenshire this, in this way, in which Shetland is not spoken about. Um, it's it's uh, in, in, on, in mainland Scotland, um, never mentioned at all, as a matter of fact. Um, so, um, so before I sort of, uh, Okay, so let me let me go back to my notes. Um, so since this is the first bit of research I've done since before Corona, and there isn't really much of a synthesis um, at this point, uh, what I want to talk to about a little bit is actually my research, my past research on electricity systems, um, and then tell you a few stories from the current research to open a conversation about what I'm thinking of as integrated diversity. Um, and before I properly begin, I want to take I want to say two things. Um, first, uh, as Achim mentioned, I'm an anthropologist, which means that I study the abundant and resplendent mess of human cultural worlds. And thus, though I will be talking about energy systems integration, um, my understanding of how um, this is how sort of change or transitioning energy systems is unfolding comes really first from what people say or what they show me and secondarily from um, the academic literature. And of course, both of these deeply inform my thinking, um, I sort of toggle between them, um, but I find that I learn as much which is surprising and nuanced from being with and talking to people as I do from quickly developed, from, from well-developed scholarly conversations. Um, both of these modes are vehicles for conceptual bodies of knowledge um, and I like to move between them. And this is a difficult thing to do. And so what you're seeing today is me trying that. And I'm really happy um, for suggestions that you might have um, for better ways to move forward um, as I move as between story um, and sort of native analytic and uh, academic uh, analysis. The second uh, thing I want to say about integrated diversity, um, which is to say, in my case, integrating different um, answers to particular problems of energy um, pr provision, um, is that it's a very hard sell in energy systems design. Um, what this means is funding and policy as well as engineering. It's complicated to um, integrate diverse systems. Um, and one size or set of components don't actually fit all case studies. So there's no way that you can make a kind of kit that is then scalable um, across cases. So there's a lot of individual uh, problem of dealing with individual sets of, of, um, of needs, integrating those into a workable system, but then that doesn't necessarily translate if we're talking about one house to the neighbor's house um, or to somebody in a slightly different climatic area. Um, Contemporary politics and even nation states that govern this politics um, are of course also coterminous with the fossil fuel phase in and gradual um, now total fossil fuel dependence. 
Um, so when we're talking about policy, the policy making bodies are also, uh, I think, um, one could say thinking with oil. So reasoning with oil. And by reasoning with oil, I simply mean um, thinking of fossil fuels as the first solution, and then also thinking of a singular solution rather than trying to figure out how to have an integrated diversity, um, which doesn't, doesn't scale well and doesn't travel well. Um, it's easier uh, to think with, to think to reason with kind of the logic of oil. Um, equally, and this is something that I'm just sort of trying out for the moment, the conservative or right wing of contemporary citizenry and many politicians at present is actually against integrated diversity across domains. No immigrants, no queers, no women doing men's jobs, even no vaccines. It's all about keeping difference outside of bodies, bodies politic and bodies physical. Energy systems design does not figure into these conversations about social, political, and bodily contamination as dangerous and to be avoided. Nevertheless, the figure of integrated diversity is the same uh, in both cases. So if one day I have a big thing to say about this work, it will probably draw parallels between the desire for the singular, pure, unadulterated um, sort of answer, singular answer that we have with oil um, and other people have already begun to do this um, in relationship to right-wing support of fossil fueled energy systems, um, which is actually called the white skin black fuels nexus. Andreas Malm uh, has written about this and Claire Daggett has also written about this. Um, so the, I was thinking about this talk that we had, it was a Tuesday talk a few weeks ago, um, where essentially the, the speaker, I, I think Achim, you will remember his name better than I, was talking about these genetically modified seeds. Um, and he, he introduced his talk by saying, here's a solution, it doesn't scale. It can't be the one, it can't be the single, single silver bullet. Here's another solution, it doesn't scale, it can't be the one. Here's another solution, it doesn't scale, it can't be the one. Here's a solution that can scale, that can answer all of our problems. And when I talk about um, reasoning with oil or sort of defaulting to the singular solution, uh, rather than saying, oh, all five of these things, if we bring them together, actually can work fairly well. Yeah, but there's a, there's a kind of um, desire for the one thing that will answer or solve all of the problems all by itself. So it's that rhetorical move um, that is uh, that I'm thinking of now as a kind of uh, oil logic or um, hydrocar logic of hydrocarbons. So I'm not going to say anything else about that now, but that's what's that's kind of what's underlying then what I will present, and I would love to talk about it in the Q and A. Um, so I'm going to tell you now how I got here, um, not to the IISS, but so my uh, dissertation research, about which I will say almost nothing, um, was in uh, Slovenia, the former Yugoslav Republic of Slovenia, um, with a bunch of sort of nutball artists. Uh, and the book for that is called The Likeness. There's a picture here. Um, and the way in which it links, I, I mean, I'm always trying to figure out how how things translate across these various projects I've done. And one thing I realized um, in talking to people in Shetland last week was that I'm actually very interested in successful transitions. Um, and the Slovene case um, was, is really brought me to it because it was this uh, transition from, from a socialist to um, a welfare state capitalist economy um, that happened without war um, which was unique uh, in Yugoslavia, um, with minimal strife, strife, with very little stress, very little poverty, no collapse. Um, and so suddenly what was happening in Slovenia was like bike lanes and a functional government and everybody got a new roof and people paid their heating bills even though they hadn't had those before. So there was all of this sort of markers of success. And that's really what drew me in um, was like, why in this place did this transition go so well? Um, so, um, and from there, that's all I will say about Slovenia um, for now. Um, 
after finishing my thesis, I began working, um, conducting research on the transformation of the US um, electric grid. Um, and the reasons for this shift we can talk about later. It's a very weird jump to make from talking about art um, to talking about the grid, um, though both are in a way um, techne. They are both uh, material systems um, for uh, organizing life uh, and creative, creative systems, in fact, for organizing life. Um, so the this is also was also a very successful story, um, and the thing that needs to be pointed out in a in a European setting is that I did this research from 2008 until uh, the book came out in 2016. I continued for another couple of years working on it. Um, it was not until 2017 uh, in North America that climate change became a motivator for action. So there was a huge integration of, um, re of renewables, of uh, variable, um, which is to say sometimes there and sometimes not, uh, and distributed, which is to say not in a single power plant, but sort of scattered everywhere like rooftop solar. There was a huge integration of these renewables um, up to, uh, in many cases, 30, 50, 70 percent um, at certain times of day and in certain markets um, without a conversation about climate change. So this transformation was happening um, because uh, one could make money um, off of producing power renewably due to a change in legislation. Um, and that got a lot of people at many, many different scales interested in producing um, electricity, which had not been the case throughout the 20th century. Um, and second, it tapped into a very strong um, cultural push uh, against uh, top-down control. So the utility system uh, in the US had a lot of control, um, in fact, total control over the production, transit, um, distribution, uh, billing, um, and care for the electricity system. And the breaking up of that monopoly um, it was very pleasurable to people, and it continues to be pleasurable to, pleasurable to people um, in the US. So these two factors um, led to this mass integration of renewables. And then at the point at which, and this was a, it was a significant technological as well as financial problem. There was a lot of policy work that needed to be done, but figuring out how to keep an electricity system on and running well, um, using these sort of new modes of, create, of making electricity um, is, is technologically hard. And the engineers that I was doing research with were very happy. They were very happy people. They were the happiest people actually I've ever worked with because they had a good problem um, that, they were, that they were working out and working on. Um, so here I have just given you a little map of Quebec. I was living actually in Montreal and working in Montreal while doing this research. So it was quite funny because Montreal still has an integrated uh, monopoly, Hydro-Quebec. Um, that is producing essentially 92% of the electricity is from hydropower. They have a very strong system, very linked to national sovereignty. Um, and uh, there are now links, as you can see, being put in from these dams very far north um, into uh, to serve the northeast of the US. Uh, this becomes important now as people begin to protest against natural gas, um, additional natural gas pipelines uh, in this area. Um, so Quebec begins to then feed and integrate into um, the Northeast. So that's why I've, I've sort of given you this picture. Um, and then I would move, I would leave this very, this sort of lovely functional system and I would go to the US which has over 3,600 um, different uh, utilities and was an absolute mess and the power was going out all the time. So looking at the transition within this um, kind of much, much more chaotic, um, chaotic creative, um, and often sort of messy and dysfunctional space, um, making this energy transition happen. Um, so, and here's the book. Um, the, I was about, uh, I don't know, five, six, seven months into this project when I realized that I did not wanna write it for an exclusively academic audience. Um, and I'll be talking in about a month um, or sort of teaching actually in about a month how to, at the ISS, um, how to think 
how to write for non-academics. And that is to say a very smart thinking um, public. Uh, and it turns out that undergraduates, which I didn't know, um, are kind of like this. So uh, they're a smart thinking public that still needs things to be spelled out plainly and to be a little bit exciting um, if they wanna engage with them. And so the, the grid, um, it, it sold about 100,000 copies at this point, and it's really, it's, uh, it's, it's used for policy, it's used by business leaders, and it's also really often taught. Um, and it has, a, because of this, it has a, a gigantic breadth of impact, which I feel like, um, in terms of actually wanting to reform, uh, I mean, I personally feel like it's important to reform the electricity system away from dependence on coal um, and natural gas. We, we don't actually use oil for electricity in the US. Um, and so it's been really lovely to see it taken up um, by communities who are actually trying to make this change happen. Um, the first half of the book is actually historical. What it doesn't do is contribute very much to anthropological theory. So it, uh, it's not that it's some sort of perfect, uh, it doesn't split the difference and have this like strong scholarly um, I'm going to change the debate within anthropology um, component to it. It really is anthropological sensibility and research that is written for a thinking public. Um, so, um, and that kind of brings me to um, where, I, where I am now. Um, these are both very interesting pictures. So I'm looking at um, slow change in the North Sea. So how species are, species are moving, how heating systems are changing inside houses, how oil platforms, there's uh, the top sides of these uh, oil platforms are sort of coming ashore. Um, and being uh, dismantled and recycled, how wind is then going into the spaces um, of oil so that energy is still there. Um, and what, I ha what you have on the left is, um, this is the grid. It's funny, I'm like drawn to the grid. I'm not actually doing research on these grids, but I just somehow they feel very um, comfortable to me as images. So the on the left side is the oil and gas um, grid. So these are parcels which are owned for exploitation within the North Sea. And um, you can see Shetland again here, um, and it has this uh, bubble around it. These are, these are waters that are controlled by Shetland. Um, so the grid is in there, but essentially they, uh, they govern these waters. Um, these, this same grid is actually then used also for, um, for offshore wind. Um, so if uh, an oil company, now we call them energy companies, owns an asset um, in the North Sea, um, if they own one of these boxes, essentially, they can do what they like uh, there in terms of um, uh, reuse of platforms. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, carbon capture and sequester in old wells. There's uh, talk about making uh, kelp farms. Um, there's wind going in, um, hydrogen storage and production. So there's the, the, the grid actually remains um, and the activities within the grid um, open up, but not completely. They're very tied to um, what was there previously. And of course, to the interests of financial and otherwise of the owners of that grid. Um, and then on the right, what you see is, um, you see the North Sea is a sort of negative space, but as a, a, a source of um, electricity for in fact, the, the bulk of um, Europe. So this is, there, so this is to say that the sea, if you look on the left, you have Shetland and a little bit of Norway, but the sea itself is a is site of uh, intense um, construction. So it's a it's a highly infrastructured space, uh, which we saw also in the beginning with all of the oil platforms out there and the um, the pipelines and under underwater electricity cables. Okay, so. Um, even though the research that I'm doing um, is, I'm really interested in this point and what is sort of what these processes of slow becoming or slow change. And I have, um, I have a hope um, that the, that again, I'm looking at something which will be successfully accomplished. 
So this is not something I can know going in. Um, but the thing about um, Shetland in particular is that the oil dependency is so in intensive. Um, so it's, a, it's an industry in which people work. Um, and in fact, when I, I'm also working with mussel farmers up there. And when, when I said to one of them, they, he asked me why I was there essentially. And I said, I'm researching um, oil. And he's like, yeah, but nobody in our industry has anything to do with oil meaning they're not working at the terminal. It's one of the largest employers, um, uh, salmon farming is the other uh, on the islands, but oil is a place where people labor and it's a thing which arrived at a certain time. So oil arrived in the 1970s uh, in Shetland. And before that there were actually, there weren't ferries, there were effectively no cars, people traveled by motorbike, um, people traveled by boat with maybe small engines, um, but this sort of this grandiose dependence upon fossil fuels was actually not there before um, oil came uh, as an industry. And people remember that arrival. So there are many projects, art projects, um, storytelling projects, jokes, um, stories which are always told, this sort of constant narrative um, about these early moments when oil came and um, the terminal was, was originally built. So we have oil as an industry, but then also in, the, in fishing, it's, it's a big industry. You have all of the fuel for boats. You have all the fuel for cars. It's rural. You can't get from place to place um, without a car. You have home heating systems, which are run on oil. You have electricity for the islands, which are created in a large diesel um, diesel plant and a small natural gas power plant. Um, you have the ferries, which bring everything, including 18 wheelers to and from Aberdeen. Um, so essentially, it, this is where I'm talking about how oil is the answer to every question, oil or natural gas. Um, and so uh, as, as the, for example, now they're, they're trying to install a large wind farm so that they can decommission the um, they can de decommission the diesel power plant. Um, and there is a lot of protest um, about this wind farm. It's people are very, very angry. Um, and nevertheless, they say, oh, in Orkney, which is sort of the next archipelago down, they have a lot of small wind. So local people, you have just wind on site. Um, it's a very windy place. And um, they say, yes, but in Orkney, it's so ugly um, because there was no organization about it. So everybody's just sort of willy nilly where the wind is being um, harvested. So this, this is like wind then becomes an answer to diesel in a power plant, but electric vehicles are not necessarily being touted as an answer to um, cars. And certainly now there's a conversation about um, hydrogen powered ferries um, and they are actually building hydrogen powered ferries right now in um, Edinburgh in the shipyards um, to try out for the island community. So you begin to get these different vectors um, and we'll talk about home heating on the next slide. Uh, if I can advance it. Okay, so even though I'm doing all different kinds of research um, on Shetland and in Aberdeen, um, and the thing that I actually did in Aberdeen this time was get all of my offshore training certificates so that I can actually go um, work um, offshore in a, on an oil platform. Um, it involves being thrown into the sea, <laughs> a fake sea in a helicopter, which is cap capsizing, um, among other things, which is, so there's all of that, right? Um, but because I'm actually most comfortable still talking about electricity um, and energy, that's what I'm gonna, I have a lot of conversations with people about these things. Um, and I wanted to just tell two stories um, today from that. So um, the first is uh, Tom Wills is uh, works, he's a very um, photogenic sort of guy. We'll see a little movie with him. Um, he lives here. Can you see my, this is Larwick, this is the main town. He lives here on Brassey, which is an island. Uh, you can only get there by ferry. And he it works for a tidal energy company called here in Blue Mool Sound, which is this uh, tiny little, it's 
called the Sound. It's just basically sort of an inlet into the North Sea. So this is the Atlantic, the Norwegian Sea, but it's the Atlantic. This is the North Sea. And the North Sea is essentially a kind of um, bucket. So the, the, when the tides come in and out, it sort of fills the North Sea and then empties the North Sea every day. Um, it's the, the force of this is the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and the North Sea is very shallow, which is why there is a lot of oil and gas which can be extracted um, there. So, and all of that tidal, tidal force is pushing through Bullell Sound right here. So um, Tom is then um, running a, a kind of first trial um, underwater tidal energy system in Bullell Sound. And it's hard because these turbines, it's essentially, I'll show you a little video, but it's essentially a two-pronged turbine that turns. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't go in these ways. It goes like this. The, the tide passes in one direction and then it passes in the other. Um, it has four periods of intense uh, tidal power every day and four periods of still. And it's always moving up and down between these. Because tides are completely predictable, um, and as Tom says, I can tell you how much power I'll be getting out of this thing in 100 years, it, to the day, um, they are actually a form of baseload power. So with a battery system attached, you can use tidal power to replace something like a coal burning power plant. What you can't do is replace the scale of a coal burning power plant. Um, so when I met Tom, I helped him build a shed um, here. <laughs> and we, he kept saying to me, you know, it's not the answer. You know, tidal is not the answer. You know, it's not the answer. It's providing right now, um, I think it was 0.4% of um, the electricity in Shetland. Yeah, there are certain places where you can have tidal, not that many. You need to have the strong tidal force. Um, and this happens, he said that it's not uh, based on the equator, um, but that actually it's rare around the equator. So this is something that I also need to try to understand. So there are only certain places in the world where you're gonna get the kind of ferocity of tides that you're gonna you get here in Blue Mill Sound. Around Southern Shetland, um, there's also a, a ferocious tidal um, push, but it, the sea is too disturbed, um, it's too wild. And so the turbines just blow apart. So I'm gonna just show you so you can see him. Um, the week before I was there, the Germans came and they made little movies about Tom. So he sent them to me. So it was really funny that I was there and that they had been there too. Um, and here's one of them. I'll just show you the beginning. Liku lies at the same latitude as Greenland's southern tip. Water is Tom's element. He sails and surfs in the rough seas and works in them as well. He's an engineer. He and fellow team members are developing a pilot project, a charging station powered exclusively by tidal energy. A little over a kilometer away from here, there's a channel called Blue Mill Sound where the tidal flow is concentrated. And our turbines sit on the seabed in about 30 meters water depth, and they're generating electricity, which arrives here via subsea cable. Off the coast of the Isle of Yell, Four turbines are at work, soon to be joined by another two. They make up the first such turbine park in the sea. On a yearly average, each one supplies not only enough power for all the islanders' electric cars, but for 60 homes as well. Starting from the Shetland Islands, Tom's employer, Nova Innovation Limited, aims to conquer the world market. This is really the tip of the iceberg. This is the first project with 300 kilowatt turbines. There are many, many gigawatts, many, many nuclear power stations worth of energy out there to be harnessed that we haven't yet touched. For many... Um, so, let me go back to the slides. Um, so this, uh, what's very funny about this, I don't know if you saw it, but this single charging station is by the toilets at um, up here at Kulavu. And this is also where the muscles, muscle processing plant is that I'm working. So actually there was always a car plugged into that um, single charging station. When he says you can power all the cars in Shetland on it, it's because there aren't really that many electric cars. Um, so it comes off as good. And also um, he's right, there is a huge amount of power in the tides. 
Um, but realistically, even if we um, build his system, which he's very excited about, into the global power network um, in all of those places, we'll get a, we can do, get about 3% um, of our electricity from tidal energy. The thing that it makes that very valuable is that, it's, that it functions like baseload. Um, so it functions like coal or natural gas. Um, with a, with a battery system. So this one charging station right by the toilets in Kulavo um, becomes this beautiful uh, movie um, for the German public, which is also a process that I, I, I like to see. But when speaking with Tom, he was very, very clear that um, over and over, this is not the answer, this is not the answer, this is not the answer. And what matters there, I think, is the word the. So this is an answer. Um, and his response, to me was, I believe in, re in relationship to the German um, video teams, there were three of them that had come in the past um, three months who were asking him if this could sort of save the world um, and uh, it can't. So second and in brief, um, and then I will be done, is um, in Aberdeenshire. So in this uh, Northern area uh, in the town of Bucky, um, which has almost no people in it, um, in this northern area above Aberdeen, again on the North Sea, um, I met a man who um, was very, very angry with the English government um, because the government in, in terms of its policies and also um, the ways in which it's supporting certain kinds of development um, was not, uh, was, only, it was only looking at electrification. So they were supporting ways of changing, for example, natural gas heating systems to electric heating systems, um, uh, petrol driven cars to, to uh, electric cars, um, sort of just across the board, it was always the single answer, we will replace fossil fuels with electricity. And so he, um, in his fifties, um, it decided to do a PhD, he's an engineer as well, decided to do a PhD at the University of Glasgow using his house as a, as a sample, um, whereby he took the problem which he had, which was not a problem of electricity, but in fact, a problem of heat. Um, electric heat is not very warming. Um, so if you are in a very damp place, um, a very windy place, electric heating is not a great solution. Um, it's, not, it doesn't, it's not radiant in the way that hot water um, heating is. So. He put on his rooftop solar PV, so photovoltaic cells to make electricity, and also solar thermal. And he was running a test with then uh, large uh, water tanks um, and uh, under, under floor hot water for heating and also hot water for um, showers, uh, running hot running water, was running, uh, attempting to run a system in Northern Scotland where there's very little sun um, to see if he could heat his home and his hot water system with solar thermal. Um, had a lot of results about this uh, and essentially the answer was yes, resoundingly except in January and February um, during which he needed to use a pellet stove um, to keep the house warm, partially because there's not very much sunlight, partially because it's much colder. Um, but the here, um, here again, his, the, the point is, is that he said, okay, the singular solution of electricity is does, does not in fact suit the problem as it is. Let's look and see if there's another solution that we can use. Solar thermal, you can put a lot of solar thermal on your roof, it takes up a lot less room. Um, and that's this picture here. This is not his house, it was pouring down rain when I was there, so I don't have a picture, but this is a solar thermal and solar PV on the same roof. Um, and then integrating these systems with each other into a home heating system. Um, so this solution, um, will not necessarily be great other places. Um, so he's fighting for the recognition of how you bring these things together, um, but is very unsure about how that might be packaged and shared. So he's sort of in a battle against the single solution, but doesn't have a good sense of how what he's come up with might actually um, become the base for other, people, uh, other people's attempts to answer this question of how to heat a, ho a home. And the last slide. So this is um, from an essay by um, Joshua Reno um, from the, it's a set of, it's a piece of work called uh, Lexicon for an Anthropocene Yet Unseen. And he's really talking about the idea of the one. Um, and I'm just gonna read it um, because this is sort of, this is as far as I've gotten in my thinking, I guess you could say. 
It has been argued that monotheism became a prominent force in the world because of the symbolic and ideological power of the logic of, of the one, that is counting to one and no more. Not only one deity and one holy book, but also one life and one death, one ruler and one people. A similar argument could be made regarding the rise of environmentalism, the importance of one earth considered as a totality emerged in tandem with early space travel and rising concerns about an imminent nuclear apocalypse. Between 1968 and 1970, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey was the top grossing film in the United States. The first photographs of the entire earth were taken from space. The Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons came into effect and Earth Day was celebrated for the first time. So he's interested in sort of the production of one earth. Um, and we see this even today in the, there is no second um, earth or there is no planet B, um, just there is one, there are not many. Um, one can, one can only subtract down to zero. Um, and so this image that everyone shows always of the one planet for this first image of the blue marble from space, he's saying that that feeds into this kind of logic of the one that was already in place. And I'm interested as well um, in the battle against that logic as we transition away from um, a reliance on fossil fuels. And that's it. Thank you. Wait, I have a last slide that says thank you. Thank you very much, Gretchen. <clears throat> then I would be happy to just open up the discussion. If you have any immediate questions or comments, please either use the hand up sign from um, Zoom or write the questions into the chat. Now, having said that, who would like to kick us off in the discussion? Adi, please. Um, hi, Gretchen. Um, thanks a lot for this super insightful and uh, engaging um, presentation about your work. Um, I'm more curious to know about uh, the um, home heating solution through solar energy. Um, I was wondering, does this uh, person, I, I, I think I forgot the name, but um, does this person convert solar energy into electricity and then use this for radiative heating or um, to heat up, to warm up the water? Uh, how, how does it work? Could you please elaborate on that? Yeah, so I didn't say his name because I haven't, I don't have permission from him. <laughs> to do that. Um, so I'll make him up a name at one point or I'll get permission to use his name. But for the, for the so what he has essentially is um, a solar thermal system, which is actually creating, these are the older systems. And my father had one in the 1970s. So before we were making um, electricity with solar PV, most of the, the solar systems that people had rooftop were solar thermal and they were simply making hot water. Um, and that hot water then drains into um, or feeds uh, uh, a hot water heater. In England, they don't have hot water heaters. Um, there used to be small hot water heaters, but they've been transitioning them out for a long time. So this is one of his battles is to like try to get the government to actually fund the reinsertion of the hot water heater into um, the home. He also said that the issue is that you have two temperatures of hot water. So he has very hot, which comes through them in the middle of the day. Um, and then he has um, mediumly warm, um, which is actually sufficient for under, under floor heating for the house. Um, so this morning and evening um, uh, sort of dim light. And I have to say like, it was pouring down rain when we were there, like gray and pouring down rain. And he said, you know, it's fine. Like if it can work here in Bucky, it can work. Um, essentially anywhere in Scotland. Um, so the, yeah, so he has a double, so he has a two tank system, under floor hot water, and then hot, very hot water for um, baths and showers. And they also have one shower that has an electric, um, you know, this little thermal thing that's, that just heats the water as it goes through. Um, there used to be natural gas, and now he has an electric one of those, which actually runs on the batteries um, off of his solar PV. Um, that so that if they actually run out of hot water that's hot enough for showers, they have one shower in the house that they can still use. Um, he says they don't need it, but they, they, he put it in for that reason. Um, and they had a giant bathtub. Um, and they said they can get four or five baths, um, you know, with guests and everything. And it's, it's actually not a problem. The, whole, the water is very, very hot. 
Yeah, that's super interesting, and I would be very curious to visit this house. <laughs> I mean, so like, I, um, I was talking yes. to him. I found him sort of in this very funny way, but I was talking to him, and I was, like, I was just like, you need to just proselytize, like start giving talks, like tell people about the details of this. And um, he has sensors all over the house because it's a PhD project. So he has sensors on the windows that are actually measuring the amount of light that's coming in as the year cycles around. Um, you know, he has sensors in the walls because the walls are these big old stone um, stone walls that he's then insulated um, the, the crap out of essentially. Um, but he has sensors that run all the way through to see how much um, how, how much heat is leaving in the winter and how much is actually moving through in the summertime. Um, it's a really amazing um, project. He also has geese. Yep, sounds really sophisticated and futuristic. Thanks a lot for sharing this. Okay, thanks. Um, has anyone else a question or comment or would like to share something on that? If this is not immediately the case, I would be interested to learn from you, Gretchen. Did you, you mentioned that three German TV teams came along actually. Yeah. And given that the person you've mentioned, I forgot his name, said it is not the answer or it's not the solution. And it is only powering something very small, actually. I'm just wondering why three teams or so? I mean, is there a rumor or so? Now this is the saving the world or how does it came about? Yeah, well, I think that that's the thing is that everybody is looking for the thing that will save the world. Um, and the his point was that there isn't a thing that will save the world. It's these things taken together um, that are made to work together that will allow us to actually do what we want, which is to maintain some semblance of the quality of life, which we currently have. Um, and, you know, in the case of the Scottish house, right? Like you don't want to live in Scotland without heat. So <laughs> how do you do that without fossil fuels? Um, so it's going to be a combination. It's essentially going to be a combination of factors and his reaction. And I was actually happy I came after the Germans because I, I, I got that reaction from him so strongly of just like, don't, please don't look at this as the solution. Um, now, again, they have four trial turbines right now. Um, they're quite small. Um, and so if he's saying 3% of um, global energy, it's actually a huge amount of electricity if you're just looking at electricity. Um, so what they're producing now with their four little turbines is not much, but it's really, it's it doesn't garner the same kind of fury um, that the large wind park that's going in Shetland does, the disturbances to the to the sea um, don't worry people as much. They just pop a little buoy on top so that nobody trawls over it um, and uh, kind of let it be at that. And you see something similar with peat, actually. Peat, uh, Shetland is covered in peat, um, at, which is a fossil fuel. Uh, it's coal in, you know, 100,000 years. <laughs> um, and it's very deep. Um, it's a it's a very deep substance, so it's sequestering carbon um, as it moves downward. So it's it's always moving downward, 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 downward. And um, there's a lot of of inattentiveness to the ability of peat to sequester carbon because it's not visible in the way that trees are. Um, so there are parts of Scotland that have been ripped up. Um, the peat has been ripped out to plant trees, and the trees don't really love living there. Um, so now they're putting the peat back in. It's kind of a, the whole thing is sort of ridiculous, but there is something about the hidden hiddenness of um, of certain kinds of technologies, or uh, if you call a peat a technology, um, that also leads to its appeal. Or um, you know, in this case, the turbines they're invisible to people in the way that peat is invisible to people, and that's. Um, that then makes it seem like an even better solution um, than the things that we can see. Thanks. Any other comments or questions? I see Myla's hand, please. Hi, Gretchen. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. That was very, very interesting. And basically just having a link with what you just said in this terms of technologies or kind of solutions that might be more invisible to people. I want, uh, I want to hear from you if you had any kind of experience or had the opportunity to hear about it, a bit of narrative relating to this. As we know, uh, this, uh, this narrative of the green transition or a transition, for example, to photovoltaic cells or electric cars and so on, and so on are very much 
uh, rooted right now in the narrative of people that are pro or that would like to have deep sea mining going on. So I think it's a way at any chance to uh, see yourself chatting with someone about this topic. So you fade in and out. So it's hard for me to know. Is the question is talking to people who are not convinced about the green transition? Or yeah, actually, can you hear me? Yeah, now. If you stay really close to the forward somehow, yeah. Okay. Can you hear me well now? Yeah. Okay. No, basically, I would like to hear from you if you had any contact with deep sea mining narratives and and how this would actually because I mean, we are talking about photovoltaic cells and so on. So I can see what were your impressions? Yeah, so this is super, uh, yeah, thank you. So I think that one of the things that draws me into the North Sea is actually the sense of the invisibility of the infrastructure, which is there. And that invisibility is purposeful. Like you cannot, um, I had actually <laughs> spoke with Achim about this. I thought, okay, maybe the best way to get to an oil platform is as a photographer. Right, like don't go in as an anthropologist or a writer, but actually go in as a photographer. So I went through all this training and at some point they said, you know, on the platform, you can't have any batteries. So you can't have your, you can't have a camera there. Now that is a true-ish, right? Um, batteries are flammable and dangerous. Um, you could have an analog camera without a battery, which is now what I have some in the closet. So now I'm thinking like, okay, maybe I could do it that way. But the the actual, the most important thing there is a control over the visibility, in fact, of the asset as they call it. Um, so the oil, even on Shetland in this picture you saw of the sort of beautiful <laughs> grasses, right? Like oil is um, largely invisible um, and it's been made invisible. Uh, Hannah Appel has a, an amazing book um, called The Licit Life of Capital um, about the off -sea, uh, offshore oil um, industry in, off, off of West Africa. Um, and she says, essentially what happens is as soon as you start doing things on land, people begin to protest. And so when you, in order to remove a, 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 a desired infrastructure or money-making scheme from protest, which is a protest is a problem, right? We know this. Um, the, one of the best things you can do is take it offshore, take it into the sea, um, and then nobody sees it anymore. Uh, so that's one answer. A second piece though, that I think is really interesting is that um, along the pipeline, so these pipelines that feed into the terminal in Shetland are warm. They've been down there for 40 years. They're, they are seabed effectively right now. Um, and the and so the fish they love they're all around like it's just like happy fish land so then the trawlers they trawl the pipelines because that's where they can catch the most fish um, and the fishing is the other big source of income um, for and a lot of people fish three weeks work at the terminal three weeks fish three weeks work at the terminal three weeks so they can actually um, subsidize oil then subsidizes this um, fishing income. Um, and the original contracts were um, with these oil companies were that when the oil was exhausted, they had to remove everything. And so there's a lot of conversation right now in the North Sea about whether or not these pipelines should be pulled out. And likewise, um, whether or not the actual bases of platforms should be pulled out because essentially they are um, protective regions for, for fish. And we're seeing this too um, with off sea, offshore um, wind you're getting these like explosions of, um, of species because in a way they're protected. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to get around and the boats aren't allowed into that space. So it becomes a kind of marine park. Um, so there's, there's always kind of the both and, um, but for sure uh, all of this offshore stuff is appealing because people can't see it. Thank you. Thanks, um, Kari, please. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. I was wondering, since you were saying you were coming back from Glasgow, is you're also looking at the kind of global connections and the kind of global level where all the discussions about those technologies are also taking place because the COP26 just started. Mm. And also maybe about the kind of longer 
history, uh, like I'm thinking about the work by Timothy Mitchell on carbon democracy or so by Jean-Baptiste Fressas on like the chaos or, of kind of having different transition after one of the, after the other and kind of being all like kind of entangled. So I wanted to have your thoughts about that. Yeah, so the, the actual deeper history, which I would say in Shetland, things start to change fairly quickly around 1800. Um, so there's a there's just a constant motion, a cultural sh set of cultural shifts that happen starting in about 1800. So far before oil, um, I'm just beginning to try to think about how that fits into the story. Um, the not before coal, right? Um, for the larger thing, actually, I'm working in Glasgow with two people. One is um, a scholar of science fiction who has become really excited about reading the texts, sort of the aspirational texts of oil companies, um, future food companies, sort of corporate plans as science fiction. Um, and the other is a scholar of the blue humanities. So she's a poet and she works a lot with island literature. And so I was actually there with them um, thinking about uh, how it is we might actually work collaboratively in the North Sea. So looking at the at corporate and governmental documents um, as a sort of symptomatic of particular kinds of futures and particular uses of, of natural resources um, and uh, and to see if there's a diagnostic function that we can actually do as scholars of, uh, of literature um, on those texts. So that's as far as I've gotten. I actually left um, the day before COP started. <laughs> I was gonna stay and then I was like, why, why would I stay? This is like <laughs> completely insane. Um, and because I'm somehow interested in something else um, right now, but I think that I have to end up there, right? Like there's no way to not, um, somehow take what's happening to the nation state. Um, I mean, I think that's the Mitchell's point, right? Like what's happening to the nation state as we, um, as we warm the planet, uh, it's the local is becoming something and the state is becoming something um, and the supra state is becoming something that wasn't before. Um, so that's, there's clearly a political transformation in process too. But I cannot talk to me in seven years. <laughs> Not there yet. Okay, thanks. Um, we have already reached 3 p.m., but you still have another six months of fellowship to go to work on these topics. So we look forward to it. And everybody, please feel free to come by and talk to Katrin. And having said that, I wish you all a very nice afternoon and see you all around, hopefully, in the Institute at some point again. Okay. Bye. Thank you for coming.